So a warm welcome to everyone to, um, I think, the sixth edition of the Equipped webinar series. And um, uh, it's very nice to see uh, familiar faces and a couple of new faces as well. Today, our speaker will be uh, Magali Haas, and uh, she is the CEO and president of Cohen's uh, Veterans Bioscience, uh, based in Massachusetts in the US. So uh, it's great to have you here. Magali. Magali is also a member of the Go Equipped uh, board, and she will be speaking today about criteria for translational validity. And um, Magali, I think I can give the floor to you. Thank you, Kim. And um, thank you to everyone who's joining us this morning. Really appreciate your participation. Um, the reason that we thought it would be important uh, to discuss criteria for translational validity in, in this portion of the webinar series um, was to provide a context for why we should all be thinking about uh, quality criteria and certification uh, and the equip system. So, of course, I refer you to our the Go Equipped website uh, to learn more about those um, certifications and um, and you can look at uh, prior webinars to learn more about the equipped quality criteria and and methodology. Um, but today we'll be focusing on translational validity. So this please, yes. Um, so uh, I'm a CNS researcher, and uh, as you may know, brain disorders are highly prevalent uh, in the population. They affect about one in three individuals globally, and therefore collectively, they are one of the greatest contributors to the overall global disease burden. Uh, yet, the majority, the vast majority of new medicinal entities that have been developed for these conditions have been abandoned during the clinical development cycle, mainly due to lack of clinical efficacy. As, as shown here, uh, as we enter into uh, phase two, phase three trials, where we're first testing um, preliminary efficacy signature signals, uh, we're, we're finding that there's a high probability that our, our trials will fail. And um, as we start to determine why that is the case, we, we have to look at what are the decisions that led us to draw the conclusion that a certain target or a certain therapeutic approach would be efficacious in the first place. And that's largely based on the type of work that we generate through the preclinical research process uh, early in. So while there are multiple reasons for clinical failure, uh, one of the most frequently cited is the ability to establish translational validity and the overall quality of the preclinical data used as the basis for an R&D decision in the first place. Um, and as I think we are all very well aware at this point, um, there has been an ongoing uh, discourse about the reproducibility challenge uh, research findings um, are only going to advance science if they are significant and reliable and reproducible. And um, starting as early as 2005 uh, with uh, the publication by John Ioannidis, which was a seminal paper, I think, for the field, um, we started to see more and more uh, evidence that uh, from uh, translational work that was being done within the industry and published by members of, of the pharmaceutical sector that a lot of the, of the work that was being published in the academic literature was not essentially reliable or reproducible. Um, and that started a cascade of programs to determine why that was the case. Uh, that led to the formation of the Global Preclinical Data For Forum, which is actually a predecessor to Equipped. Uh, the Global Preclinical Data Forum helped to uh, uh, file uh, the proposals to the IMI for Equipped, and many of the members are members of both entities. Um, it also led Francis Collins at the National Institutes of Health in the United States uh, to, uh, to publish this report on reproducibility um, and for the National Academies of Sciences in the United States also to conduct an, a series of workshops that I'm showing here, um, asking the question about 
course, what is the utility and translation ability of animal models for CNS disorders? And then later on, what could we be doing to improve and accelerate therapeutic development, perhaps without the benefit of animal models per se? Um, so as you can see, this is a topic of great interest uh, to many of us in, in the field. Um, and so in this webinar, uh, I wanted to define the concept of translation, discuss how various types of uh, preclinical research contribute to the drug development process, um, but also present some of the tools and novel approaches that have been developed in recent years to improve the translation of innovative ideas from bench to bedside. Um, I do think it's important to note that preclinical testing of a drug in, in an animal model is not a prerequisite for regulatory agencies before entering clinical trials. Therefore, given the ethical considerations of using animals, um, their use in particular in clinical research and development really requires substantiation. And by that, I mean that the derived data must be conclusive and must be essential to the R&D process in order for us to continue, consider using animal models. Um, additionally, I want to present today some emerging alternative translational approaches that could be used to cross-validate and or even enhance the translational value of preclinical model. Advance the slide here. Um, so uh, this, is, uh, this is a synthesis from a really very nicely uh, published article by Denaire et al. Uh, in 2014 that um, speaks to many of the factors that impact translational validity um, in animal model and the use of animal models. And particularly, um, they point out um, the, the issues of the proper design and, con and conduct and the reporting uh, that accompanies these, um, these programs. Um, so I thought it would be worthwhile to consider each of these and then look at our R&D process and where these may all have a part to play in a sort of use case approach. Um, so first and foremost, we should be thinking about um, animal species and strains that we're using uh, in, in the selection for uh, testing. Um, the drug that we're going to be testing should be fully uh, cross-reactive to the target in the animal. So if, if that receptor system isn't uh, present, if that form isn't present, obviously the drug's not going to interact in the same way. Uh, we should be thinking about the age, gender, and health status of the animals that we're looking to match as closely as possible to the clinical condition. And um, the thing, the what comes to mind is when we think about uh, conditions like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease or any other adult CNS disorder where we're using uh, animal models, are those animal models really uh, age match in a sense uh, to the condition that we're interested in? Or do they have the comorbidities that may be contributing to the condition? We know dementia, for example, has a cardiovascular component, a contributory risk component. Um, do do the rodents necessarily have that comorbidity um, as well in, in terms of, of, the, of the model development, as an example? So that's one of the first considerations. And then, of course, thinking about the time course of treatment, um, if you think about when are we intervening, um, in most of these animal models, uh, the time frame in which we're conducting these experiments is rather short. Uh, we're frequently initiating uh, either prophylactic treatment or treatment right as the, the disease pathology is being initiated in the model system. But in contrast to that, where the onset of symptoms and the diagnosis in humans uh, can be ongoing for years, um, and, uh, and then administration of a therapeutic treatment is happening later in the course of disease. So uh, we may or may not understand the true benefit of a therapeutic intervention if we're looking at it in, in sort of an acute uh, model of uh, preclinical disease model. Um, another, another consideration is uh, subjective endpoints um, that are often used in animal models and particularly in neuroscience where we have a high reliance on behavioral models. Um, the endpoints are very subjective in the case where 
uh, individuals have to score the behaviors. Um, and of course, there are now better methodologies to videotape um, the animals and to score them computationally through automated methods. But even so, there's a potential to create bias if the scorer is unaware, is aware of the animal's treatment in the course of conducting the experiment. So, so it's really important to think about blinding. It's really important to think about how uh, these endpoints are being established and whether or not they can be objectively interpreted. Um, We'll spend some, some time, we've spent a lot of time in this webinar series talking about reproducibility and reporting of results, so I won't elaborate on that. Um, there's clearly a need to standardize methods across labs. When we talk about reproducibility and robustness, what we're saying is, can you reproduce the same results reliably over and over again uh, in multiple maps? in multiple laboratories where there may be subtle differences in the environment or in, um, in the materials being used, but the results themselves should be robust enough that we should be able to rely on those um, as we think about advancing therapeutics forward. And part of the challenge is in the clear documentation of, method all, of the methods that are being used are they detailed enough in order for us to reproduce an experiment in another laboratory in another condition? Uh, many of those early papers by industry really were pointing to the lack of good method of documentation. So when um, the industry partners would try to bring an experiment in-house, they really weren't able to reproduce the experiment because of a lack of understanding of the experimental conditions. Um, and finally, of course, uh, experiments with a positive outcome are more likely to be published than negative results, uh, and that's all, that's all the way up and down the line. The, the, the methods that didn't work, the, the findings that weren't conclusive, all of that is lost uh, to the field, and that's actually one of the reasons that the Global Preclinical Data Forum, in concert with the European College of Neuropsychopharmacology, has launched the Negative Data Prize. Um, and we are looking for submissions for this year's uh, prize. If you're interested to check that out, um, you can go to our website and learn more about that because we want to promote uh, the publication of negative results just as much as we promote the uh, publication of positive results. Finally, um, another uh, major factor that contributes uh, to translatability is, is the group size, the power uh, within the experiment. Um, and for many good reasons in animal research, um, we've had a bias towards reducing the number of animals used in experiments. But in a sense, we've done this in an arbitrary way because uh, we focused on minimization and, uh, above all other considerations. And in fact, what we need to do is balance uh, the, the statistical power required to generate solid data uh, versus um, the minimal number needed uh, in order to minimize the impact on animals. So uh, there has to be a balance there. If the results of the experiment are not going to be conclusive because we don't have the statistical power to interpret them, then that is literally a waste of animals and a waste of life. So uh, that's another consideration. Um, so I wanted to show you now um, how to think about these in the context of translational validity. We all, do, there are a lot of reasons people do animal research apart from our, the R&D process, but I wanted to put it in the context of the research and development process. So in the center, what I have here is an illustration of where preclinical research plays a part in R&D versus uh, clinical research. Um, obviously, early in, um, as we're discovering new therapeutics, as we're thinking about the disease models and where to target, there's a role even uh, before this preclinical phase, which we would generally call basic science. Um, but here in the preclinical uh, stage, what you're starting to do is translate uh, what we believe to be true about the biology into something that's applicable or applied in the context of, of, of R&D setting. Um, and the 
the data and the and the experiments that we're we're doing have to inform uh, the formulation development, the pharmacokinetics and pharmacology, the toxicology assessments, safety assessments um, of these therapeutics. And preclinical models are often very valuable for doing exactly that. Um, and when I say preclinical, that encompasses a broad array of model systems. It's not just animal models, as, as you'll see in a, in a minute. Um, and then we have a tendency to then uh, I'll say linearly then pursue a clinical uh, R&D process where we then enter into human testing in phase one, um, doing phase two studies where we start evaluating the efficacy of, of these therapeutics and finally doing conclusive experiments in phase three, which hopefully lead to positive trials and an NDA submission. And I say it's, it's a linear process because there's a tendency to think of these things as um, one happens first and then the other. And I would, I would posit that actually we need to think about a closed loop model system and approach that allows us to link back the clinical data back to our preclinical um, work and, and, ensure, and that's going to enhance the validity of the work we do. So when we're thinking about modeling or translational validity, um, we have to ask, what is it that we're trying to operationalize um, what is the construct that we're trying to, in fact, uh, develop a model for? And, um, and so I, I did some work in advance of this um, webinar to just look up, is there a well-established, de defined definition of translational validity and research? And it's interesting to find that um, it, it, there are many, many definitions. There's no sort of one standard approach. And, um, and this is the best uh, definition that I could find, uh, essentially asking, are we, when we're talking about translational validity, we're saying that whatever it is that we're using as a surrogate for knowing uh, what the effect is in the clinical system in the human this time um, is actually a, a representative and good oper operationalization of that thing we're trying to measure and that we can actually do that, that it actually is um, something we can implement and execute. So this is sort of like a hypothetical construct of thinking about what is construct validity, um, but let's start looking at it in a practical sense. Um, so this paper, uh, another one I highly recommend uh, by Belzong et al. from 2011, looks specifically at all of the different types of criteria that could be addressed to validate animal models um, in terms of psychiatric disorders relative to the human condition. And as you can see here, there are many, many domains that one can be thinking about in terms of establishing validity criteria. Um, we could be looking at, for example, ethological validity. Um, if you're looking at um, a disease, for example, in the human, which requires high order cognition, does the animal have that type of high order cognition as well? Many rodents do not reflect the same level of cognitive traits. Uh, language, for example, may or may not be ethologically valid uh, to evaluate across these systems. Um, other areas that we tend to look at are face validity. Um, and an example of face validity might be if we're looking at a trauma model, as we do at uh, Cohen Veterans Bioscience, do, uh, do we have uh, traumatic experiences that emulate the experiences experienced in humans, whether that's traumatic brain injuries or uh, post-traumatic stress disorder related psychiatric uh, brain injuries? Uh, are on the face of them, they may have face validity. We may hit an animal on the head and think that it's similar to hitting yourself, a human on the head, um, but that's just face validity. The question then would be, does the result of that mechanical force then result in the same biological processes um, after the fact? Um, do we see 
uh, the same inflammatory uh, markers? Do we see the same contusions? Do we see the same impact on axonal shearing? Those are the types of things that we would start wanting to understand, which now gets us to a different validity criteria. These might be biomarker validity criteria or construct validity criteria. So as you can see, um, what you want to be thinking about as we're th asking, it, do I have the right model system for the disease that I want to uh, develop a therapeutic? The first question is, um, do I understand the human condition itself? Do I have enough insight uh, to understand what is happening in the human condition to then to identify the appropriate uh, animal model that uh, represents the constructs of interest? Uh, in common with the human condition. So I'm uh, many times I see in the literature and in, and, uh, in other work that people are trying to uh, match the condition to the model that they have rather than the other way around. Um, and that's, that, that is a point of failure. Um, also, uh, as I just uh, identified, construct validity is really the most, one of the most critical criteria that we need to establish at a minimum not just face validity. And many, many of the behavioral models that are used today really only have face validity for uh, neuroscience related disorders. So this is something that really needs to be addressed across the field. Um, other types of preclinical models um, beyond animal models um, include human inducible pluripotential stem cell lines. Um, and uh, I hear um, there's a lot of interest in using human inducible pluripotential stem cells where you take um, a, a cell from a human and then you uh, transpose it into uh, a cell of interest. And in the case of neuroscience, our interest would be to take somatic cells and convert them into neurons. Um, and there are new methods uh, that are very interesting uh, to, to go directly uh, to neuronal cell lines without necessarily going to a ground state. Um, and that, that method, those methodologies retain a lot of the phenotypic um, components of the disease, or they claim to. Um, and so the question is, is that true, right? Is that valid? Do we know what components of the phenotype are preser preserved as we, let's say, take a fibroblast and convert it to a dopaminergic cell or glutamatergic cell? Does it have the same properties as the human uh, neuro neuronal phenotype would in the patient in the clinic? Um, and there are many different ways that you could assess that using functional uh, and screening assays. Um, some are, are identified here. You can look at the electrophysiology of these neurons. You can look at the expression within these neurons. You could look at protein-protein um, interaction networks uh, driven uh, across these neurons. You can look at the morphology and ask whether they reflect uh, the pathology and the clinical phenotypes that we see in the clinical setting. But if you don't have that type of data in, in the first hand, then uh, establishing the validity of these inducible pluripotential cell models is going to be lacking. So this is another example where validity needs to be established more robustly across um, our field. Another area of validity, uh, which we don't tend to think about, is validity of methods and validity of measurement. Um, and in this example here, um, I'm sharing the results of a study that we conducted looking at different assays. Uh, these are blood-based assays that are measuring different uh, cytokines or in, the other, in another experiment we did with metabolites, uh, asking, can you measure the thing you're interested, the analyte you're interested in measuring with high fidelity? Um, and what we did was we blindly sent uh, multiple samples to different companies uh, asked them to run those samples. And we say blindly, that's why we call it a bake-off. They didn't know what was inside uh, the, the sample that we sent them. Sometimes it was just a duplicate. Uh, sometimes it was from a patient population. Sometimes it was a spiked sample with a NIST standard. But everybody got the exact same co copies of, of these, uh, of these uh, 
samples. And then they sent the uh, results back to us. And then we unblinded the experiment to say whether or not uh, they were measuring, they thought they were measuring uh, with high, high performance accuracy. Looking at measurements like um, coefficients of variance, if I take two measures uh, at two different time points and is the result the same, is this the samples the same? If the coefficient of variance is greater than 20%, that's, that's a problem for um, interpreting the results. And we're seeing here are the results of this experiment where, in fact, um, there was a lot of variance uh, of, of the ability of these different assay systems to measure the exact same analytes um, to, in terms of uh, precision and in terms of parallelism and, um, and limits of detection. Um, so if you're going to do the experiment, you have to know what is the analyte I need to measure and do I have the right assay to measure it in the first place? And this is another failure point for translational validity. And another consideration is, do these assays work similarly in human uh, blood versus uh, blood coming from animals and, and the analytes that we're trying to measure in animals? And in many cases, uh, they they are very different and we have to establish uh, assays for the animals as well. So um, as, a, as sort of an alternative uh, way to think about uh, how we could approach it, um, I thought it'd be interesting to explore other methods and technologies that may be available to us to, to advance our translational validity approaches. Uh, one here is, um, I, I've, I've said over and over again, I think that we have to understand the human condition in order to model it. And uh, in many cases, especially in neuroscience, we simply don't understand the pathologic mechanisms underlying many of these conditions. Um, and, I, and we continue to take a very reductionistic approach to trying to understand what, what is causing these conditions. Um, and one of the things that we now have in our, at our disposal is the advantage of computational modeling and, and AI. And I think, as we've seen this year particularly, um, we can see that these, me these AI um, systems have incredible uh, power to take large, big data sets and, um, and to interpret them or to develop models from those data in ways that I think we previously couldn't have even anticipated. So here, what I'm showing is that um, at any point in time, when you have a, a disease, you're also healthy at the same time, right? You you are on a continuum of, of health in the course of your lifetime. And at different points in time, you may be feeling better, you may be feeling worse, you may be healed, you may be uh, have some kind of external environmental factor that worsens your condition. And I think it's uh, it's been a challenge for us that we always think about disease as sort of like a single point in time or a single condition when actually it's a continuous uh, con condition and it's a complex condition where we see that there are many uh, biological factors that then interact with many external or exposome factors. And with computational methodology, we have an opportunity to take all of that data and start to build systems models, interactive models, simulations, if you will, of what's happening and develop alternative model uh, systems that could eventually in time, maybe even replace uh, some of the preclinical model systems that we have established. But importantly, uh, what we can do here then is start to create a closed loop approach where we take data from humans, we model them and look for these uh, constructs, these cause and effect relationships and confirm those through biological experiments, confirm them through the preclinical experiments and that in that way cross validate between the human and the preclinical model systems uh, to ultimately develop a better understanding and, and validation of both, both the com computational approaches and the preclinical approaches. So I think this is a powerful new tool and, and a new way to think about uh, translationally validating uh, our, our work. And uh, another interesting opportunity is uh, in terms of new technologies. 
Um, here I'm showing a new technology that was developed um, at a, a nonprofit organization called IMEC, uh, which is based in, the, in uh, Belgium. And um, they developed CMOS technologies. And this technology was de developed quite some time ago, but um, it took a while to bring it to the community um, because we had to we had to understand how the community was going to use this technology best. Um, what you're seeing on the left is um, that that needle at the end is the size of a hair, and um, so it's just but it has a thousand electrodes on it, and you can simultaneously record from a rodent's brain across multiple layers, as you can see on the right side from a, a paper that was published in Nature um, by June et al. Um, where you can do high density recording of neural activity simultaneously with high fidelity. So you can imagine that if you had this type of data, both from humans and from animals, we are in a position now to start really understanding how uh, the, what's going on in the brain from an electrophysiological perspective. Then if you could do neuroimaging across rodents and humans, and find those correlates, you can do the same thing again. And if you can feed all of this data into a computational framework, um, then we really have the opportunity to start building robust models of both animals and of humans in this case. Um, so I wanted just to end by uh, saying that this is the work of Co-Inventors Bioscience. We are focused on establishing enabling platforms across um, the spectrum of post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury. Um, and we uh, would love to talk to anyone who's interested about ways that we can pursue and, and really um, move the field forward in terms of translational validity of many of these model systems for TBI and PTSD. So I thank you for your attention. And I think we have time for questions. Thanks, Magali. Uh, that was a really good uh, uh, overview and excellent uh, presentation. And uh, yeah, the floor is open for questions from the audience. Please uh, uh, speak up if you can, uh, or write them in the chat if you're for some reason unable to unmute yourself. Now I pose a question to the audience. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, has anyone out there, um, is anyone out there aware of any truly translationally validated um, models for uh, CNS disorders? Take a stab at that. Um, yeah, or maybe someone has a, a favorite. I'm not really in the CNS field myself, but maybe other people are. I have a question for Magali, actually. Okay. So um, let's look at another field for a moment. So let's look at Alzheimer's uh, disease and uh the failure that has been made there so that uh going down a path uh looking at the sort of the wrong etiology of a disease that better amyloids are the the, the cause of a disease and and focusing the entire development over the past 20 years on the prevention of this. now they have a drug the uh lacuna uh, map but the overall efficacy of that drug is in no relation really to the cost that is behind this. So what does this tell you sort of like for you as a company and also in, in, in your field? What what have what learnings do you have um, and, and do you draw to not making this mistake? The rest of this field. Well, I, I think um, Alzheimer's field is a, is exactly the kind of example where um, 
everyone pursued a sort of reductionistic approach and thinking about this as uh, it's amyloid or it's tau or it's a single thing. And now um, as we're opening the lens and considering other possibilities, and as we're using big data approaches to collect data from populations, not just focused on the one thing we think it might be related to, we're learning that there are a lot of interactions that um, are contributory to uh, the pathogenic process in Alzheimer's disease. So, um, you know, there's there's clearly a cardiovascular component. There's some data that suggests maybe the uh, you know the viral exposure is a risk factor. So, if you start thinking about it from that perspective, um, if you are able to longitudinally map and measure uh, across a, a person's lifespan. Uh, all, uh, their state, like I said, this interactome uh, state over time, you would start probably to understand the contributions of these various factors to the ultimate development of their pathology and, and then be able to order uh, what happens first, second, and third, what are early signals, what are later signals of the condition. But you also would have an opportunity to think about where is the greatest effect size um, going to be gleaned for treatment? Uh, we're currently looking at sort of the end of the spectrum is, if you will, of, of the pathogenic process. So it's, it, you know, amyloid ha probably has a role and tau has a role, but is that the largest effect uh, in terms of having prevention of dementia? And, and should we be looking elsewhere for preventative approaches? Um, the current methods uh, and approaches haven't really yielded the fruit because they aren't looking at it from a systems approach. In my opinion. <laughs> and, and it's funny because uh, about 10 years ago, we wrote a paper called uh, from big data to smart data, um, and we published it in the Alzheimer's Journal. And the whole premise was maybe we really do need to take systems modeling approach. Um, at that time, no one read the paper. And suddenly in the last year with GPT and all of this out, um, I finding so many people are picking it up and realizing, oh, we could do this, right? <laughs> maybe. Um, so I, I think that the technologies have advanced, and I think people's understanding of the power of comp computational approaches has also changed dramatically in the last decade. So what do you think, where are we going in terms, you already mentioned uh, uh, the big computational approaches, but on the other hand, uh, uh, you have with these, the, the garbage in, garbage out problem, so uh, in terms a, for, of, all, of the quality that's in there, the documentation that is there, and also alone, I think, you know, especially with PTSD, uh, the severity, you know, uh, and uh, that, that many symptoms have uh, a different etiology and maybe then just a common uh, phenotype. So what is needed really in, in a development there, sort of like an, on the input side to prevent us sort of like that our computations go wrong or lead us other, to the wrong way? I mean, I think it's the same exact issue that we've been talking about, whether it's animal models, human inducible for potential stem cell models or computational models. It's all about the quality of the data and the data methodologies and whether or not we are paying attention to how those data are collected under what conditions. Um, and documenting it, as you say. As an example, um, we we worked a few years ago with a group to um, try to do a computational model of multiple sclerosis. And uh, they had a very large, um, deep, uh, it should have been a deep uh, data set in terms of measuring not just uh, the clinical symptoms and not just um, one endpoint like um, MRI, but also collecting um, other data, blood samples, so that you can look at genetics and, and transcriptomics and so forth. 
um, but the problem was that um, they didn't pay enough attention to the methodology. So in fact, there were a lot of missing data. Um, so subjects will enroll in the study, but I, I want to do this, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to do the MRI, but I want to take the blood sample or vice versa. Now you have a lot of missing data, so you can't build that in integrative model. Um, or the way that the blood samples are being collected uh, isn't um, to a best practice standard in terms of SOPs that ensure that the blood itself, um, when assayed, is going to generate quality data. So it's always just the same issues. Um, and we see it all the time again and again in, in all of our everyday uh, programs and grants um, as we work with different partner groups to ensure that there is high quality, really. <laughs> so it always comes back to equipped, right? In a sense, um, do we understand the quality of the work that we're doing and do we uh, document it? Uh, thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, I just had a question on your first or amongst your first slides, you had the, the various gaps in translation and phase one, the gap was safety. So uh, a lot of the I think a lot of the um, discussion around preclinical validity is about target validation, but safety is about toxicology. Could, do you have some more comments maybe on current toxicological methodology and, and where the gaps are there? Um, yeah, so interesting. I think, uh, again, a lot of the same questions around um, are we really uh, modeling the same safety um, considerations um, uh, that we have in humans that, as we see as we're trying to model in the, in the animal model? Um, for example, if you think about comorbidities uh, that are often present in humans, um, those things are not necessarily being modeled. We're modeling one thing at a time, of course, and we don't have uh, a very clear way to take things together, um, right? If, you're, if you have liver failure, you're likely to also have maybe kidney failure and, and things like that together. Um, I think also age um, in these models, again, for toxicology uh, matters. We know that renal function, liver function, all of these things change with age dramatically. Um, your, your brain gets leakier as you age. So, you know, again, uh, do we have a model for blood brain barrier and understanding what's happening across that uh, in terms of toxicology and, and, and uh, safety considerations, pharmacological, pharmacokinetic considerations. Um, there, Every single one of these systems are, are really just limited by the extent to which the model really represents the construct of the thing we're trying to model. And our model systems are, are, are not necessarily um, addressing the age, the gender, there's another gap. <laughs> a yeah. lot of reproducibility issues. Yeah. A lot of, of lack of gender-based uh, studies, um, and and uh, and how to work with uh, female rodents. Um, so I, I think those are all uh, factors. And and I think for toxicology, um, we've seen a rise in computational methods. So the FDA has explored using computational methods to. Um, to model cardiovascular and liver uh, toxicity. And I think those, again, because you're using human data to develop the models uh, may provide a, a better construct validity than, than trying to use animal equivalents. I, I just think it's very interesting that, that maybe models, toxicology modules don't get the same uh, and level of discussion as maybe target validation models and it's equally important. Um, just a couple of other just minor follow-up curiosity questions um i don't I, i'm assuming you're aware of the animal model quality assessment paper that glaxo smith klein put out i saw a presentation on that uh, uh last month that was i think i uh, trying to identify very similar issues they didn't their examples seem to be limited but i think it's a good i, I think they're next also to equip d or there's some kind of relation there but i think it's a good uh uh, many of the things you've identified, they use the same references as well, of, of you know, a framework of saying this is what you can expect for your model. So, so that was just a just a just to throw that out, just a general please, question. Please, please post it in the uh, chat. That, the link. 
because okay, I will. I will. I am not aware of that paper. Uh, this isn't what I focus on most of the day, <laughs> so it would be great uh, to uh, to have that, re that reference as well. Thank you. I, I will. There's also, um, well, they gave a seminar on it, so um, I'll try and find a link to that if it's uh, available for recording as well. It's more on the animal training thing. And the other thing is just, 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 uh, I'm just curious to know what you or your organization's opinion on is on microdosing studies. Uh, as in in terms of uh, go straight to man and try and extrapolate directly for for drug benefit or or drug performance there. <laughs> uh, are you talking about the whole psychedelics uh, research uh, arena? No, no, I mean microdosing, meaning in, um, using either uh, I guess PET imaging or mass spec to detect the pharmacokinetics of very small and not active uh, uh, relations yeah. with drugs. So tracer techniques to establish some of the parameters which you could then, uh, in theory, at least predict. It, it's the, the approach has been around for a while, but it, it I guess it's not, I, I don't think it's ever been as mainstream as, as the potential perhaps suggested. Um, I, I don't have enough of a background to uh, really provide, you know, an expert opinion, but um, just, just, riffing with you on the fly, I mean, my first question would be, um, given the lack of resolution that we have to measure things, um, even when we have bulk delivery of, of uh, molecules to the brain, uh, I'd be curious how we are able to then, um, then measure things when things are at, at a sort of a nano level <laughs> comparatively, right? Uh, so, you know, we, we we have a lot of difficulty um, doing pharmacokinetic assessments, pharmacodynamic assessments, uh, even now with bulk dosing. How is that going? To, how are we doing it if we're if we're trying to micro? So, so I, I guess the uh, perhaps this is a follow up conversation, but I, I guess the idea is because of the sensitivity of PET, you can you can measure these extremely low concentrations. So, for example, things like does it get into the brain? and how much gets into the brain you could look at. Also, there's obviously well-established, uh, if you have a novel drug, to use your pet tracer to measure directly target engagement in, in human as a as a, the first step on your pharmacodynamic, um, uh, I guess, audit trail, if you can use terminology from the council world. Um, well, as I said, I'm not a subject matter expert on that topic. Um, I would imagine that, you know, even with pet ligands and everything else, it's always going to be limited by um, the availability of the ligand in, in the system as well, right? Uh, and, and the detection and assay limits, it's an assay at the end of the day. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, it comes back to the same set of questions of, uh, how well can they measure with what degree of resolution and reliability at what at what concentration? Um, and I don't know. I don't know those. Uh, I'm not familiar enough with that data to to comment in it further. Okay, but it's a great it's a great topic. Great topic. And, uh, and and thanks for a really nice presentation as well. Um, very enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I ask for another opinion, maybe? Um, so you, you, you mentioned, uh, of course, uh, um, yeah, um, IPSCs as a, and other alternatives, uh, but it's, it seems like that the, the main route for, for drug development still goes through through animals and through rodent models, but but knowing the limitations and knowing also that most diseases that we're trying to treat have a large uh, uh, immunological component. And knowing that these animals in terms of the validity have like an in, totally inert immune system. We know of the, 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 the microbiome, there's also the dermatome. So many things that we discover now that these models do not have that could also play a role. Uh, shouldn't we sort of like downplay animal models a little bit in development here or put greater limitations on them rather than really sort of like use this as as this as this path where we can explore from 
Um, what's your opinion on that? Well, I, as as you mentioned, um, in neuroscience, um, there still has been classically a, a, a reliance on behavioral models, but and I think now with a lot of the GWAS work that's happening and a lot of um, other uh, biomarker work that's happening, we're starting to see a next generation of models being generated that are built off of genetics, for example, and understanding the genetic roles. But then of course here you're dealing with polygenic conditions and um, unless you have a, a disease which has you know major large <laughs> uh, gene of, of high uh, effect, um, you're not necessarily understanding polygenic effects um, unless you model that. Uh, and there are groups that are trying to do that uh, as in, in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and elsewhere um, and getting closer and closer to reflecting possibly the, the risk, the polygenic risk and then developing model systems that start to emulate the, the biological uh, pathogenic processes that we see in humans. Um, I think also, uh, I don't believe that, I, I, you know, it, it it's just like there's no one algorithm or computational model that you should rely on to model a system. You, you want to come at it from multiple models and see if you if you yield the same general results. It's the same thing for hum, for the for iPS cell lines. It's the same thing for uh, these clinical uh, uh, animal models. I think we have to ask, what is the thing we are trying to model specifically? A construct of, of a disease or the entire disease? We're not, we can maybe model sleep architectures, for example, in PTSD, if we can identify the, the correlate sleep spindle pathognomonic uh, changes that we see in humans and then, and then look for that same thing in the animal. But we're not going to uh, model PTSD as a whole. Um, or schizophrenia as a whole, or anything else as a whole. Um, what we're looking for is, is just that biotype or that construct that might be uh, translationally valid and then see what, what your molecule of interest is doing in the context of that subset of, uh, or of, uh, of biology. And then sort of building up a story, right, from there. Um, and that's why I do think we have to look at it for, from a systems perspective and not just try to think that um, we can figure it out based on on one thing or another. I see. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I typed my comment in the chat because uh, my connection was unstable. But uh, indeed, I was very interested in your uh, emphasis on first making sure that we have the correct uh, construct validity of animal models and translational validity, um, because I've had the argument in the past that uh, I was trying to systematically re systematically review animal studies um, on efficacy, but that that was actually not the purpose of these studies. They were supposed to elucidate mechanisms of disease. And But now it strikes me that if we are not sure that our animal models actually model disease as it appears in humans, this argument is going to lead you in a circle because first you model something of which you're unsure that it's correct. And then you study the mechanism in that model. It tells you a lot about mice, but not about humans. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and, and that was in fact, the basis of many of the, of the uh, workshops that were held already uh, in, in 2011, 2014, um, you know, really asking, what do we think these model systems are modeling in terms of these conditions? Um, how is it that we really are modeling schizophrenia in a mouse? You know, it's a psychosis in a mouse and cognitive deficits in a mouse and mood changes in a mouse. What does that really mean? Um, so um, the, other, the other side of that coin is a very interesting approach taken by um, a group uh, called Psychogenics um, in the United States. It's a, it's a CRO where they actually use computational approaches to, and they, they observe animals under different uh, therapeutic conditions. So they're being treated with an antipsychotic or a variety of antipsychotics, and then they're being phenotyped of, with, uh, with, through video and, and other measurements. And they're sort of creating a, a, a signature, if you will, 
of the condition of 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 the profile of of the animal under that perturbogen or that that mo molecule um, and then looking for other drugs that emulate that same kind of phenotype they still don't really know what's necessarily the disease and they don't necessarily know what's going on but they could find other therapeutics that maybe are improvements upon uh, the the ones that we know already work and in fact that approach worked uh, for them in a new schizophrenia program that is uh, in the market is is in, i think just got approved uh, recently in the last two years so it's interesting we think we need to know exactly what's going on <laughs> but in fact this is a very clever way to to get at least to um, a better me too um, a therapeutic approach uh, through through that sort of approach, and it's it's a combination of animal modeling and computational modeling. That's really interesting. Yeah, it, it's it's fascinating <laughs> to me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there, it was a new schizophrenia therapeutic that was brought to market using that approach. That's great news. Are there any uh, other questions from the audience? Or remarks? Well, with uh, two minutes to spare, then I think we can uh, close uh, this wonderful session. Thank you so much, uh, Magali, for uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, speaking for us today. Um, I was actually uh, mistaken a little bit because today was the seventh uh, edition already of the Equipped webinar series. Uh, and we will have the eighth uh, edition in two weeks when uh, we will have uh, Christoph Emmerich and Anton Bespalov speaking more about the Equipped quality system. So we hope that uh, that's also. Now everybody knows we need one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it will sort of the topics of the past editions will hopefully lead up to uh, our confidence that uh, this quality system is uh, useful and perhaps uh, necessary. Um, so uh, yeah, we hope to see you uh, again in uh, the next edition on um, June 7th. Thanks everyone and have a great uh, day or evening wherever you are. Thank you for everyone who joined. <laughs>